Hello and welcome to another episode of the Empowered Hormones podcast. I'm your host, Sheridan Decker, and I'm stoked to have you guys here again. Uh, Today, I'm chatting to Ellie, which is going to be awesome because I have had her on the podcast before, but today we're going into something a little bit different. We have chatted about iron previously, and I've talked to a lot of these guys about iron on a day-to-day basis, but today we want to dive a little bit more in and around iron and pregnancy um, and just sort of how it can impact you. So Ellie is a registered nutritionist, so she loves helping active women to achieve their weight training, gut health and hormone balancing goals. So thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you on again. Thanks for having me, Sheridan. It's great to be here. I feel like it was a couple of, oh, the podcast is two years old. Well, I feel like it was near the start. I don't know the episode off the top of my head. It would have been 30, 40, somewhere that I had you on, I reckon. So that would be close to two years ago. Yeah, no, time flies, right? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. How has your business changed or what's happened in the last couple of years or what what are you doing these days? Give us a little rundown. Yeah, well, a bit's changed. Um, so when I spoke to you last, I was working with the natural nutritionist um, as part of their team, which was an honor and a pleasure to be a part of. And then last May, so let's say a year ago, uh, I made the decision to step out on my own entirely and just focus on nutritionally. So my clinic. Uh, so I've been doing that for the last year mainly virtual, but I do still have a physical presence in Torquay. Uh, But I also had a three-month mat leave, so I'm just sort of coming back now. Um, I reopened three weeks ago and, yeah, had a three-month mat leave. So since I've seen you, I've, you know, changed businesses, got pregnant, had my baby Bella, and um, now now I'm back uh, to being in in clinic. Crazy, isn't it, like... So much happens. That's so exciting because when I spoke to you last time, um, we chatted a lot about plant-based nutrition and training and stuff because obviously, I mean, you've had a baby and things now, but you were doing quite a bit of training at the time. I think a lot of running and stuff. Yeah. So um, oh, not as much running as I have in the past. So my background is marathon running, not professionally, just, you know, for enjoyment's sake, um, <laughs> the, the crazy people that enjoy the marathons. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I still work a lot with active women, perhaps a little bit less in the plant-based space, mm. just just due to who's who's drawn to working with me. So I work a lot with active women and often there's hormone balancing and or body compositional goals in and around that sort of lifestyle that they lead. And I've always worked with preconception, pregnancy and postpartum. And I guess to some degree, given my experience in the last you know, year to two years in preparing to conceive, conceiving, being pregnant, working through my own nutritional challenges during pregnancy. I've just, um, you know, attracted that sort of clientele as well. So when people say like, what's your specialty? It's, it's really hard to narrow it down. Um, people, if, you know, if you, if you looked at me on social media, you would think I work a lot in the fat loss space and body compositional change, which I do. I'd say 85% of my clients have a body comp goal that they're working towards, but it's so much deeper than simply looking at calories in calories out when you're working in fat loss. And that's what I love about being in this space and being present for my clients, because it is hormone balancing, it's gut health, it's looking at exercise and how you you nourish yourself around exercise. It's looking at um, lifestyle and stress management and nutrient status, because all of these things affect someone's ability to lose weight ultimately. Yeah, for sure. And I think the other thing that really struck with me last time was we chatted about plant-based nutrition primarily, um, but you talked about therapeutically using other things like, you know, it might be eggs or it might be meat here or there or things when someone was in quite a sort of healing state and it didn't mean going and eating, you know, a steak every day, but there was elements of it where you went, oh, this might be appropriate for you then and then. And we sort of chatted through that. Where is your stance on food now? Are you still um, predominantly plant-based or has that shifted and changed with pregnancy or how did that go for you? Good question. So I was eating eggs preconception. So uh, otherwise plant-based diet with eggs was what I was, what I was consuming for 
least a year preconception and I'm still ate eggs throughout pregnancy and today uh, and maybe some butter, but that would be the extent of, you know, non-plant-based food items in my diet. Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't mean that I, I only practice with people who eat plant-based or who are happy to exclude everything other than eggs. That's my personal preference um, to, you know, to avoid eating animals that have had to have been slaughtered. But the reason I went plant-based, you know, however long ago it was now, it's been an evolution probably for the last 10 years, was really because I was just so disheartened by the state that our meat production industry has had to get to in order to meet human demand and requirements. So I really just wanted to create a website and re- and recipes and a program as a way of just inspiring people to learn how to rely less on meat. Uh, and that, I guess that's my stance is like, let's learn how to rely a little bit less. So yeah, if you like chicken, if you like red meat, if you like fish, have it but do you have to rely on it for three meals a day seven days a week let's broaden you know broaden your repertoire of um yeah. what if what a full meal looks like broaden yeah. I your love that. yeah and also I feel like because a lot of us have um constrictive views around like nutrition and plant-based eating in a sense that it's not that you have to go either one or the other but it's like can we extend more of this into our day-to-day diet kind of like what you're saying and where you sit on that spectrum is personal and health-based and there's so many reasons around it but if you can make the plant-based side of things interesting and tasty and then attractive then people could do the same thing they go oh I don't have to have chicken and rice for every single meal or whatever and you kind of go hey these meals are great me or no meat and then the big thing I found is that when people try and do this solo without the guidance of someone like you they end up excluding a lot of key nutrients and it's the Mm. same as someone goes carnivore and does it without any guidelines in a sense and they end up eating cheap meat every day or keto or whatever you're missing the whole point of it like it's like well if you're going carnivore they actually rely a lot on organ meats and other things as well to make it healthy or gaps or whatever you know or AIP is the same any healing protocol it's like everyone gets so focused on what they you know can't eat and then they stick to like the easiest simplest things but if you go vegan and then just eat broccoli every day it's like well you're missing the point like that's not the point yeah there's potential for big gaps and like you said, it's worth working with a clinician to help you work through plant-based so you don't fall into into holes. And the reality is, is that it's very likely that you may fall into a hole if you're consuming an entirely plant-based diet. And especially if you are cutting corners and not really thinking about your supplement protocol or what's coming in day to day or what testing you're doing to keep an eye on things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're, if you're trying to conceive and, or you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding, then my gosh, the risk for, for holes appearing is even greater. Um, you know, when it comes to iron intake, our requirements in pregnancy, you know, a woman's requirement in pregnancy is it's big. It's bigger than a menstruating female's requirement, which is already very high. Um, if for relativity's sake, a female, um, menstruating but not pregnant has an iron requirement of 18 milligrams per day or that's our RDI and in pregnancy that becomes 27 milligrams per day and on a plant-based diet we're talking about consuming about 80 percent more to make up for the lack of absorption from non-heme iron products so that's our plant-based iron sources like your tofu tempeh legumes and steam greens and nuts and seeds so it's very difficult for pregnant women to achieve intake just of something like iron as an example if they're consuming an entirely plant-based diet. So yeah, you need to get advice and support. But how did you nutrients. do it, Ellie? Like that just sounds to me like I struggle with the ears and I eat meat and I'm very yes. specific with what I eat. But I'm like, flip if I remove my or predominant man my red meat sources, I'd be like, I don't know where I'm going to get this from. I know. Where do you fill the gap? Mm. And you're right. A lot of 
carnivorous females struggle with something like iron levels in pregnancy. And that's that's because of that increased demand, that increased RDI during pregnancy. Like that fetus is just, um, you know, just sucking the iron right out of you when you're pregnant. That's when they're building their iron stores. So how do you do it? Well, that's why I I did choose to eat eggs because it is at least a heme source of iron. So the bioavailability is, is, um, is good. Uh, I also chose to eat, eat eggs preconception for other reasons. Um, things like vitamin D, vitamin A, choline, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, a great source of protein. So they really do contain a lot. Um, eggs. Interrupt you quickly on that. Does it matter with eggs how you have them then? Like if you're baking them in a cake, and this is probably a really dumb question, I should know this, but if you're baking and cooking them, I just always read different research about keeping the yolk um, not 100% runny but less cooked, you know, like a fully boiled egg as opposed to a slightly runnier yolk. It Does the heat at all or any sort of heat denature any of the vitamins, minerals, anything? Good question. I actually haven't looked at the research around it. I got, it wouldn't impact iron. Um, mm. Potentially the omegas in there, the omega threes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, That'd be something so have I, to go, we have to go away and look at now. Yeah, I know. I know. I read something the other day because it always gets me. I actually like my eggs slightly runnier, so it doesn't bother me. Like I don't like a real powdery cooked egg yolk. But I was thinking about it when I was baking with them. I think, and I was like, if this is sitting in an oven for an hour, I'm like. Do I, getting do I everything be changing any of the availability of them? I don't know. Just There'd be on. a lot that aren't impacted. Like I said, the iron, the, the D wouldn't be, yeah. um, the protein. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but we may have to look into other things. <laughs> Watch it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. I will. Um, yeah. So you're eating eggs and then anything eggs. in particular you love? Um, supplementing. I mean, not to say that I love supplementing, but the reality of a plant-based diet for most women, menstruating, preconception, pregnancy, postpartum is an iron supplement is not a failure. It might just be a requirement. And the the feeling that I get from a lot of plant-based consumers, followers, clients is that needing to supplement is failing. Like you're, you know, you're not doing the the diet, so to speak, well enough. And I certainly wouldn't look at it that way, especially in the case of iron and nutrients like B12 and sometimes even zinc and iodine. Um, We just might not be able to meet requirements uh, from a largely plant-based diet, especially in times of upregulated need. So I supplemented with iron actually for probably about a year or a year and a half before I conceived and throughout conception as well for a couple of reasons. Um, One, because prior to conceiving, it is ideal for a woman to have ferritin levels of 50 micrograms um, per gram or sorry, 50 um, micrograms per litre or more to ensure that there's minimized risk of um, iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia later in pregnancy. So that was a goal of mine prior to conceiving and part of my preconception plan. And I used an iron supplement to help me do that. And I just maintained that supplement throughout pregnancy, but I had to increase my dose at certain stages in pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. That's not to say I wasn't consuming other iron rich yeah. foods. You know, tofu, tempeh is something I would consume three to five times a week. Lentils and legumes pretty much every day. Eggs pretty much every day. Green leafy vegetables, nuts and seeds, they're part of my daily diet. Mm-hmm. Um, but an iron supplement is what I needed and what a lot of menstruating, preconception, pregnant women, plant based or not, might need. Yeah. So prior to pregnancy, um, being plant-based, you know, the last so many years, were you not supplementing them? Like you managed to keep your iron in range without a supplement or you still, because obviously it is harder to absorb, you would still supplement with it or only sort of leading into pregnancy that sort of year before you went, I, I need extra needs, therefore I'll, 
up my dose. Yeah. If we go right back in my journey around, so I went, I started plant-based in about 2011. It was 2011. Yeah. When I was living in the U S and in 2016, I had a bit of a health crisis, um, burnout, anxiety. My IBS symptoms had really reached a a, um, a crescendo and I was very uncomfortable. I wasn't practicing as a nutritionist then, but I, I was working in health and wellbeing space. I still had my qualifications to practice as a nutritionist. Um, and something had to, oh, I also lost my period. Um, so I did a lot of testing. I did stool analysis. I did blood testing. I did hormone profiling. And at the end of all of that, Uh, based on my iron studies and the state of my gut, I decided to start eating some animal protein again. And it was literally organic grass-fed red meat and eggs that I included strategically in the diet. And I made myself a promise that when my iron studies and my gut were healthy, I would stop eating meat and eggs. So that was back in 2016. And I think it was 2017 um, where I went plant-based again. And then it wasn't until preconception that I started an iron supplement. So yeah, I was actually able to maintain um, healthy iron um, studies and um, uh, hemoglobin levels for a good few years before starting a preconception supplement. So then my next million dollar question is what supplement are we taking? Because that's, I think, where most women then get stuck. Like they sort of get to a point where their iron has bottomed out completely and they're either at a point going, I've been told I need an iron infusion and I personally am hesitant to say definitely go get an iron infusion. I know there's def- like different chains of thoughts around it, but I do see a lot of clients get sick from them. And sometimes yeah. I think the heavy dump of minerals on the body and those kinds of things. Like I just, I, from what I've read, I don't love it. Um, but then I'm, you know, also there's so many trains of thought about supplementing and feeding other pathogens and overgrowths and all this stuff. So it's obviously got to be a considered approach. But I think a lot of women then just go and buy a ferro grade C and then feel awful on it or, you know, get really constipated. And then they're like, well, this sucks. And then they stop and they deal with the symptoms of low iron, which is not fun either. Yeah, exactly. Well, first things first is actually assessing iron levels to determine if supplementation or infusion or dietary changes are needed. And the reason I say that is because iron studies in mainstream medicine are actually really poorly interpreted Mm -hmm. um, and then they lead to unnecessary supplementation, unnecessary infusion and unnecessary fear. So first things first, if you're going to get your, if you're going to treat iron, you need to make sure you are testing appropriately and analyzing that test appropriately. So the tests to get are serum iron studies, CRP, which is an inflammatory marker and a full blood examination. And these are tests that women should do ideally after 10 to 12 hours of fasting in the morning, ideally not when they're menstruating uh, and ideally not within a day or two of having a supplemental form of iron. Then when you're looking at iron studies, iron is certainly not the first result that you're looking at. Ferritin, not the first result you're looking at. It's actually saturation and transferrin that you're assessing firstly to look at an individual indication of appetite, thirst, degree of deficiency. So the body's appetite, the body's thirst for more iron. Um, if transferrin is high and above our, uh, above um, the, the, um, the top of the band, then that's an indicator that the body is looking for more. If saturation is low, so below 20%, that's an indication that the body is looking for more. Then we look at ferritin. So ferritin is, in my practice, based on evidence um, to suggest that some women can be quite happy with a ferritin of you know 25 or 30 or more. That's about where I'm looking outside of the preconception phase. The preconception phase is an exception to the rule where we're looking for the 50 micrograms per litre goal when it comes to ferritin. 
So if a ferritin is low, well then, sorry, if a ferritin is low and the saturation and the transferrin are looking quite good, then that's one when we might intervene with, you know, a slightly more subtle intervention like increasing um, dietary iron or maybe a moderate dose iron supplement, depending on whether an increase in dietary iron is possible. If ferritin is low and the saturation and transferrin are outside of our ideal, well, that's when, yeah, okay, there's a, a definite need for dietary iron increase or a definite need for a supplement. Mm. If we look at those iron studies and move on to a full blood examination where we see hematocrit is low or hemoglobin is low, then that would indicate iron deficiency anemia, which is where an infusion may be indicated. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is the message that often gets missed in pregnancy as well, is that an infusion is really indicated when iron deficiency anemia, IDA, is present. When there's iron deficiency without anemia, you really should be looking at those earlier interventions, um, diet and or supplement. So. I hope that helps a little bit in understanding firstly, like when to intervene and then giving an idea of what to intervene with. I know you want to going to want to know about the type of iron supplement though, because the type of iron supplement that's being used will definitely impact adherence to the, uh, to the supplement protocol and therefore someone's ability to recover from um, iron deficiency so, yeah, something like Ferrograd C, over the counter, cheap, poorly absorbed iron supplement. It's a really high dose to counteract that, that, that poorly absorbed form of iron. So, it will likely lead to symptoms like constipation, um, hard to pass stools, GI discomfort. I think it's something like one third of women using um, a Ferrograd C will experience those symptoms and, and then eventually stop taking the supplement before they've um, achieved what they needed to achieve. So I usually recommend an iron bisglycinate. Mm. Um, I don't mind if I give brand names. Um, Most of these are practitioner only supplements anyway. So you need to work with a practitioner, but um, Biomedica Bioheme is a nice one. Um, Heme Synergy from Orthoplex or um, Metagenics, um, Hemogenics Iron Advanced, I actually flip and change between all of those depending on the patient. Um, So, for example, someone that's plant-based and not on a multi-B complex might actually really benefit from the heme synergy because there's a whole um, B complex in there as well as vitamin A, which might be a necessity to help with iron absorption, especially in someone with an otherwise vitamin A deficient diet like someone on a plant-based diet. Uh, yeah, the Biomedica Bioheme is is probably my go-to because it's um, also got um, lactoferrin in there, which is a protein that can help with the iron absorption. So I choose a supplement actually based on the individual and, and based on their needs. So that's even how personalised a approach to treating iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia is if you're working with a practitioner. It's not even just the type of iron, it's what's with that iron to help that person benefit from the supplement. Yeah, and like I love that because I use the Biomedica one for me personally, like when stuff, like if I've noticed it's dropped or whatever, but I love that because I feel like that's such a key thing that people miss is that nothing none of our minerals none of our vitamins nothing works in isolation you know and I remember learning this when I did like a HTMA course on like hair trace mineral analysis or whatever and I was like oh someone's low on magnesium supplement magnesium you know what I mean but there's so many cofactors around these Mm. minerals and iron's a classic one you know like an egg is the perfect example there's a range of things inside the egg that are helping all those nutrients absorb and work together and stuff you know it's not just protein it's not just iron it's it's that whole yeah cofactors of things I love that the whole package yeah um and you are right like there are risks of having too much iron um especially in pregnancy Uh, having too much iron, which is where the risk of infusion comes from, may impact preterm 
birth or um, lead to risk of preterm birth or low birth weight and certainly potentially adverse effects for the mother, which is what we see in the general population. Um, uh, so we we do want to avoid unnecessarily inflating iron levels, ferritin levels, um, pregnancy or not. Um, in pregnancy, because requirements are higher, like I said before, RDI is, is higher in pregnancy, that that fetus is sucking the life out of um out of a, a woman's um iron intake and iron stores. Requirements are higher, but you still don't want excessively high levels. And the temptation for some um, obstetricians and doctors is to simply say to their patients, if they're pregnant, take a supplement. You know, we don't need to check your levels, just take a supplement. Um, the World Health Organization does suggest that all pregnant women take a supplement. However, um, many countries around the world take a more nuanced approach to it and say, you know, iron supplementation should really be reserved for pregnant women who need it. And that's really the stance in Australia, except for those isolated cases. And that's certainly the way that I approach my clients as well. Um, treating iron levels, preconception and in pregnancy should really be based on the individual and their pathology. Um, would you then recommend based on that information that women are getting tested every, what, three months or more or less throughout, you know, leading up to throughout pregnancy? Like is there yeah. a... Yeah. So preconception, minimum three months prior to trying to conceive, if not six months, my clients, if I know that they want to conceive, I will usually say, can you give me three or even six months of um, preparation time? Or at least let's do some bloods, ideally six months out, because if something isn't where we need it to be, like that ferritin, if it's not at the 50 micrograms per litre, then we want time to build that up um, rather than having to like go with, you know, the sledgehammer like infusion to get it up prior to conceiving type of thing. So yes, testing regularly and it starts preconception. And then we want to do a test in the late stages of trimester one, trimester one ferritin levels are the greatest indicator of um, likely iron adequacy later in pregnancy, like late trimester two, early trimester three. And then we want to test iron somewhere after week 20 and ideally again after week 34 if there's been um, low levels. And that's because the fetus will really start increasing um, iron uptake from week 20 and that's where you're likely to see the biggest drop in the mother's ferritin levels and or increase in transferrin levels after week 20, but it will reach its peak at week 34. So if levels at trimester one look good, I'll say, okay, we're still going to plan a, um, a test for, you know, um, week 20 or a little bit beyond. And then depending on what those results look like, we will definitely be planning a test for week 34 ish mm -hmm. and maybe another one in there depending on those turning on that second test that trimester mm -hmm. two result and then coming into breastfeeding or whether they choose to breastfeed or not but breastfeeding say and then post-pregnancy you know mm -hmm. like is there like breastfeeding you must be main, trying to maintain a high level of nutrients I guess because you're still feeding like Yep, absolutely. Breastfeeding you are. Um, the biggest risk post, well, not biggest risk, but postpartum um, iron levels can be at risk of being low because of that blood loss that may have happened in delivery. Um, so for all of my postpartum clients, it's a six-week follow-up, six-week follow-up, six-week postpartum test. Yeah. Um, or depending on what, what your life is like in that postpartum phase, it may end up being an eight week or a 10 week, like it was in my case. Um, uh, and then you, you manage things from there. And that's another reason why we want, um, iron levels to be really healthy prior to being full term is to buffer against that blood loss that could happen in delivery. 
Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I guess like, you know, that iron does drop. My brain just goes, well, iron drops fatigue and everything else. Plus you're not sleeping a lot because you're feeding a baby, you know, like there'd be so many repercussions for having low iron, not only for the baby, but for the mother herself as well, I would think. Yeah. So in pregnancy, um, the, 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 the baby's um, fetus baby, I prefer to call it baby by that stage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in pregnancy, the, the baby's iron requirements will be the last to be affected. So its iron requirements will be prioritized when there, when the ferritin is less than 15, 13 is when baby's iron levels may start to become compromised. Certainly when there's iron deficiency anemia in pregnancy, which might be uh, like a ferritin of less than 13 and a hemoglobin of less than 100 in trimester three or less than 105 in trimester two, that would also start to pose risk for the baby. Yeah. Um, so their iron levels and, and their weight. Um before that stage, so where the ferritin is not below 13 or 15, um, maybe let's say it's 18 or 20, that's not considered to be um, iron deficiency anemia or even iron deficiency in pregnancy, that is, in a trimester two or trimester three stage. That's because of a... Um, a result of what's called hemodilution. So in pregnancy, plasma volume is greater. So a ferritin of 16 or 18 in a non-pregnant female, like oh, that'd be really scary, wouldn't it? If you saw a client with a ferritin of 17, you'd be super worried. But because of hemodilution in pregnancy, we're not so worried about a ferritin of that level. But it may result in some symptom, like some symptoms. There may be some fatigue or heart palpitations mm-hmm. present. Certainly for me, my experience, um, not that my experience necessarily dictates everybody else's. This is, a, you know, N equals one type scenario. Um, I had quite low ferritin. Um, I think the lowest it got that I actually measured was a nine in trimester two, but I didn't have iron deficiency anemia. So my hemoglobin was 106 when I had a ferritin of nine, which is actually not considered anemic um, for the stage of pregnancy that I was at. So trimester two, but I was feeling the symptoms. So I did have um, uh, shallow breath, um, to fatigue, you know, going upstairs and I was fatigued and I know it was associated with my iron because when I started to increase my supplement, those symptoms did dissipate. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. Amazing that you see that so fast. Yeah. Saw it pretty quickly. Don't get me wrong. There was still a level of pregnancy fatigue and I was still sometimes short of breath just because lung capacity um, is compromised in pregnancy, uh, but it wasn't to the same degree as it was when I got that that trimester two result of a ferritin of nine. And why do you think it dropped? Like if you were supplementing and were very conscious with what you're eating and things, like is it? it the just, demand. The demand was just Just, just simply there. the demand, yep. I would have been needing um, uh, at least 32 milligrams of iron per day. And I just wouldn't have been doing that That's for, so yeah, it, it's a lot. Yeah. So it's really interesting when I, I, I saw this in um, my research on iron in pregnancy, the cost of iron in pregnancy is 500 to 1.2 grams of iron. Now to put that into perspective, our pre-pregnancy iron body content is about three grams or milligrams. Sorry. That's insane. Sorry, three grams. Yeah. And our pre and our costs are 500 milligrams to 1.2 grams. So yeah, it's like a, th- a third of all the iron that's stored in our body. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Across the board then, how was the rest of your pregnancy? Like obviously you noticed the stuff with the iron. Were you quite sick? Were you quite well? Or No, it's pretty well. Yeah, trimester one I had a little bit of, you know, morning sickness, um, which really was nausea and a little bit of a change in food preferences mm. and fatigue. 
And that I was many, I was able to keep under control if I managed to get a little midday nap in. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, uh, you know, just manufactured my, my clinic days to allow for like a 20 minute nap in yeah. the middle of the day. And that really helped to get me through the rest of the day. Maybe I had some snacks on hand, like some banana or um, seed crackers or something. They tended to help as well. Yeah. Um, that really dissipated by week, pretty much week 11, week 12. And then later in pregnancy, it must have been week 27, 28, I got um, quite bad SIJ pain um, or, or pelvic pain, which took about two or three weeks to dissipate. Um, from my understanding, from speaking with, um, you know, osteopath and um, chiropractor is that that is quite a common time for women to experience that SIJ pain. If they get on top of it, it won't last for the entire pregnancy, which it didn't in my case. Yeah. Yeah. But I was waddling like a very pregnant lady when I was just 28 weeks, of, 28 weeks pregnant. Oh, incredible. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. We're in Byron where I, you know, had imagined that I'd be like this beautiful pregnant woman glowing. And I was like waddling, you know, waddling along the beach <laughs> to get to the water. Because this um, was your first pregnancy, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 And then nutritionally wise, supplement wise, is there anything you feel like you would do different next time or, you know, because you obviously, like you said, you started a year sort of out going, I'm supplementing this Mm. item and I'm doing things and stuff. Do you feel like you're quite well, like prepared nutritionally wise going into it? Yeah, I was, I was, I, um, I, you know, trying to lead by example I I did my I did my testing actually probably 12 months out from when I thought we would start trying to conceive and I did everything I did stool analysis hormone profile blood testing and not that all of my clients have to do all of those tests 12 months out but with my history of um, hypothalamic amenorrhea and parasites and dysbiosis and low iron I really wanted to just do a um a full assessment of all of those things 12 months out to like retweak if I needed and to give myself plenty of time if I needed. I knew I didn't want to go start eating meat again, for example, if I had low iron. So I wanted to have time to subtly, well not subtly, but you know, pro- slowly increase my levels through a supplement rather than like eating red meat again at that yeah. time. Yeah. Um so no, like not to took my own horn, but I felt really well prepared for pregnancy. Yeah, I would like to think I'd be in the same space because I come from such a similar background as you, like, you know, the missing periods for so many years and all the gut issues and everything else. I think, Cliff, if I ever met someone who was like, I'm, you know, thinking about having a baby, I would be the same. I'd be like, okay, microbiome, what's it looking like right now? And the hormones and everything else. Because you're right, there's so many factors to consider. And I just feel like women do get quite overwhelmed when they're kind of like, or oh. so it's kind of like, well, I don't know, I'll just try and eat my fruit and veg. And then if I fall pregnant, I fall pregnant. But there's so many other things to it. And when they're working with someone like you, you can really break it down and go, okay, these are our nutritional requirements, how we're going to get there. These are the foods we're going to eat. These are things we might need to supplement based on your sort of test results and things. And I just feel like that's such a blessing and takes away so much of that overwhelm rather than going, I want to have a healthy baby and I want to have a great pregnancy and I don't even know where to start. Like yeah. there's so there can just be so many things. Or like I said, like so many women are struggling with low iron already as it is and can't seem to get it up and then are yeah, trying cheat forms and not eating the right foods or not absorbing it well. Or there's just there's so much around it. It's so complex. Mm. Um there is a bit of a theme in um the medical space to like almost try and disregard the need for supplements preconception or pregnant um, or preconception or when pregnant to the point where some doctors will say like, you just need to take your folic acid, uh, otherwise also known as B9 and folate or folinic acid or methylfolate. And they would certainly be the types we prefer to supplement with. But having supplements in pregnancy is not failing. I think it really is sometimes a necessity, just not just in the plant-based space, but to really help to make that an enjoyable pregnancy, to really support optimal fetal growth, reduce risk of preterm um, labor and or um, spontaneous abortion, and also to 
enhance and optimize quality of life for the mother postpartum as well. So, you know, using things like a multivitamin that does contain some zinc and some um, some folate and B12, uh, maybe some iodine and adding in some omega-3s, whether it be plant sourced or um, fish source, adding in some vitamin D according to the test results, using a probiotic, all of these things are evidence-based supplements to use in pregnancy at the right amount at the right times to enhance quality of life while pregnant and outcomes for the baby and the mother postpartum. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you're a hundred percent right. And I love that. And I love that approach. And like you said, it's, it's not failing and nutrition is amazing. And obviously we both strongly believe that and work in that space every single day, but the women we're generally working with are, you know, are struggling on some level or they're not absorbing things or they're not getting the right things. Or even if they are eating a whole food diet, like you said, and hitting a lot of the boxes, sometimes you do need that additional bit and that's okay. Like that's totally fine. Yeah. Um, for those who do want to learn more about you, I love your approach and what you do. Um, where is the best place to find you? Um, my website really. So that's nutritionally.com. So nutrition with E L L Y at the end and then dot com. Um, artic- blog articles there, recipes, um, resources, um, you know, masterclass. Um, I've got called Burn Fat for Fuel and my plant based program, which is plant based Kickstarter. Uh, and then I am active on Instagram, getting back into work and mum life. I'm not as active on Instagram as I would like to be, but you can also follow me on Instagram, which is at nutritionally. Awesome. And I'll tag all those things in the show notes for you guys. And are you, because you're coming back from mat leave and having baby, are you taking a one-on-one clients at the moment or are you, yeah? Yeah. Most of my practice is one-on-one and I'm seeing, um, same client seeing clients at the moment there's space for some new clients if they're happy to go on a waiting list um, but at the moment it's predominantly clients that were working with me um, prior to mat leave yeah awesome well thank you so much thanks for all that information i am yeah i'm going to put a lot of that in the show notes because i think it was amazing um your knowledge is incredible as always i yeah do strongly look up to you so thank you for what you're doing in the health space and yeah i just really appreciate your time Awesome. Thanks, Sheridan. Great to be here. Thanks, Al.